13 Lectures on General History of China by Liu Zheng Chapter 11 The Qing Dynasty in the early years following the Qing Army's capture of Beijing via the Shanghai Pass. The Qing made great efforts to reverse the maladministration that had characterized the latter period of the Ming Dynasty. They straightaway abolished the three army provisions, San Shang. A general term for the three forms of taxation imposed by the Ming government, Liao Shang, Zhao Shang, and Lian Xiang. But the early part of Emperor Shunji's reign was marred by political instability owing to the marked ethnic hostility between the Han Chinese and their Manchu masters. Among the reasons for this were the land enclosure policy and the severity of the measures taken against the so-called escapees, which seriously undermined social stability. A further problem arose owing to Emperor Shunji's favoring of Han culture and hence his tendency to place Han officials in important positions thus incurring the resentment of the eight-banner aristocracy. On the other hand, ordinary people and the literati of Han ethnic group, especially those living south of the Yangtze River, had experienced firsthand the brutality with which the Qing army suppressed the southern Ming regime on first entering central China and maintained a strong sense of the superiority of Han culture over other cultures. These remained strongly opposed to Manchu rule. The challenge of how to resolve the conflicts between the Han people and Manchus restore a stable political order. And especially when the support of the Han populated regions at large was one of the legacies that Emperor Shunji left to Emperor Kangxi. 1. The Qing legal system with the essential purpose of serving the autocratic monarchy. The Chinese system of institutions in effect protected the absolute imperial authority exerted over society that ignored social governance. In order to prevent bribery, the drawing of lots was introduced into the selection of officials in the Qing dynasty as the formal way of entering civil service. The imperial examination functioned as a guarantee of the essential quality of the bureaucracy group much better than other methods. On the base of the laws of the Great Ming, the Qing Code, Da Qing Lu Li, was stipulated in the fourth year of Emperor Shunji of Qing and continued to be edited in the reigns of Emperors Kangxi, Yongzheng, and Qianlong. The final version was promulgated in the fifth year of Emperor Qianlong. As a result, the authority of the regulations had started to go beyond the code itself in the Qing legal system. In terms of the punishments, besides beating, imprisonment, exile, strangulation, and decapitation, the forced labor in armies as accession punishment. The exile to the frontier armies and forced labor, the two punishments, bearing the Kang, and death by slow slicing were added. The Qing dynasty had recourse to a lenient judiciary which was based on the principle of cultivating people by morality, educating people by punishments in contrast to the attitude of lenient law enforcement directed the Manchu officials. The Qing authority strictly and ruthlessly enforced the laws against the Confucian authors who were imprisoned or executed for writing materials considered offensive by the imperial court. The literary inquisition conducted under the early Qing emperors should be regarded as a serious blemish on the record of the Kangxi, Yongzheng, and Qianlong Golden Age. 
A golden age has need of intellectuals who are allowed to criticize government abuses and whose frank advice is valued. However, the civilian rule of these three emperors was premised on the principle of preserving an absolute monarchy. Under the pressure of the literary inquisition, scholars were afraid to discuss the political issues of the day in case they made a single remark that might offend the imperial court. All they could do was retire to their studies and immerse themselves in the past, making sure not to stray outside the permitted bounds. This mostly meant concentrating on academic research on ancient texts, the results of which, they hoped, would win them the admiration of their fellow scholars. The Qing Literary Inquisition severed this link between traditional Confucian culture and contemporary politics, and as a consequence, the theoretical underpinning of the moral criteria for political activity was lost. This led to an undermining of standards in society generally and widespread moral decline. 2. Social practice in the Qing dynasty's most cities were divided into four sections by the central cross streets in the Qing dynasties. Merchants and their trade were the most active parts of urban life. One of the significant features of merchants was that they were bonded by hometown fellowships and formed numerous collectivist unions. These merchant collectivist unions would conduct their business nationwide. There were numerous merchant unions in the Qing dynasty. The merchant unions built mansions in most of the major cities. Regional union mansions and guild mansions were among them. Merchants believed in and conducted their business according to the moral code of honesty, trust, benevolence, and justice. Millions of fortunes were accumulated through trade and management. The economic pattern in rural areas during the Qing dynasties continued to be based on small-scale farming undertaken by individual peasant families. However, the small-scale peasant economy became associated with the markets more and more. Peasants were not only self-sufficient but also brought their farming products to the market for exchange. Over time the peasants depended more and more on the market. They obtained manufacturing necessities and individual consumer products through market exchange. In addition, they also started to offer farming products processing services. In the Qing dynasty, the Bao Jia system was widely implemented. Every ten jaws would be considered as a Bao. A leader would be selected at each administrative level. Bao Jia became the basic public security and educational organization. In the Qing periods, the role of a patriarchal clan could not be underestimated in Chinese social life. Social collectivist organizations which were formed according to patriarchal clans existed in many areas. Administrative institutions were established within each patriarchal clan. The head of the clan was considered as the principal person in the administrative institutions. Each patriarchal clan would normally construct an ancestral temple. All of the families that belonged to one clan would assemble in the ancestral temple on Qingming festival and the winter solstice day for clan ceremonies. The head of the clan would normally announce the pedigree of their clans, emphasize the code of ethics of their clan, and read out the ancestors' quotes at the ceremonies. 
Then the families would gather and dine together in a proper sequence after the ceremony in order to share the luck and fortune brought to the offspring by their ancestors. The ancestral temple was also the place for its administrative institution to mediate clan disputes, reward excellence, and punish wrongdoings in accordance with the doctrines of the clan. 3. The Golden Age of Emperors Kangxi, Yongzheng, and Qianlong established by Manchurian aristocrats after their entry into the Shanhaiguan Pass in 1644. The Qing Dynasty was China's last feudal empire. Thanks to its farm and poll tax reform and wasteland reclamation award policy, this dynasty enjoyed over 100 years of growth and prosperity. After the founding of the Qing Dynasty, the great efforts made by Emperors Shunji, Kangxi, Yongzheng, and Qianlong led to another age of prosperity for China which old history books call the Golden Age of Emperors Kangxi and Qianlong. Emperor Kangxi was 61 years on the throne, 1661 to 1722, making his the longest reign in Chinese history. His successor, Emperor Yongzheng, reigned for a relatively short time, from 1722 to 1736. While Emperor Qianlong, after a reign of 60 years from 1736 to 1796, abdicated in favor of Emperor Jia Qing. Ostensibly the Golden Age lasted for over 130 years. Emperor Kangxi, who ascended the throne at a very early age, was assisted by four regents. But his career as emperor only really began after he personally took over the reins of power and got rid of the regent Oboi, who had been manipulating state affairs to his own advantage. The emperor's first important strategic decision then was to quell the revolt of the three feudatories, San Fan. This laid the foundations on which the prosperity of the following years was built. The three feudatories emerged during the period when the Manchus entered China proper. At the time when Ming and Qing forces were locked in a stalemate in Liaodong. Three of Ming General Mao Wenlong's 1579-1629 subordinates Kong Yud, 1602-1652, Zhang Zhongming, 1604-1649, and Shang Kashi, 1604-1676, surrendered to the Manchu ruler Hong Taiji. And when the Qing army entered China proper, the general of the Shanghai Pass, Wu Sangui, 1612 to 1678 also capitulated from then on these generals who had gone over to the Qing took the lead in the campaign to pacify the country especially the power base of the Ming remnants in the south in Emperor Shunji's reign the Qing court granted General Kong Yu the title of Prince Pacifier of the South Ding Nan Wang, and installed him in the Guangxi area. Although his base was later destroyed by a southern Ming force under Li Dingguo, Zhang Zhongming, Jing Nan Wang, and Shang Kashi, Ping Nan Wang, were given similar titles and installed in the Guangdong area. The former later moved to Fujian and his title passed in turn to his son Zhang Jimao and grandson Zhang Jingzhong. Wu Sangui was made Prince Pacifier of the West, Ping Shi Wang, and installed in the Yunnan area. By the time Emperor Kangxi came to the throne, order had been restored in the empire. 
However, the three feudatories had accumulated considerable power and controlled massive military forces. The annual pay for these forces alone amounted to 20 million taels and was a source of concern to the Qing government. In the twelfth year of Emperor Kangxi's reign, Shang Kishi requested permission to retire to Liaodong, and Emperor Kangxi decided to take this opportunity to dismiss the feudatories, an act that provoked the outbreak of the rebellion. Wu Sangui was the most powerful of the three feudatories. At the beginning of the rebellion, engulfed half of China, the Qing sent forth generals and troops who, advancing with caution, began the long-drawn-out struggle with the rebels. It took eight years of war before Emperor Kangxi finally put down the rebellion. The later Qing dynasty era was regarded as one of the darkest and most politically corrupt periods in Chinese history. The Qing emperors were at the center of this system, and they were surrounded at both central and local levels by a large number of fully functional and closely linked bureaucratic groups whose job was to safeguard the emperor's authority and autocracy by managing people's discontents and crushing any insurgents and revolt. Manifold problems of the autocratic monarchy, which had been accumulating over 2,000 years, could not be eliminated by the rulers themselves. Thus, the problems were fully exposed, which eventually inflamed widespread social conflicts. 4. Determination of ethnic policy in order to resolve the problem of Manchu-Han relations and win the support of the Han literati. Emperor Kangxi's orders to local officials to make recommendations to the imperial court. A number of Han intellectuals, after being examined in some very simple subjects, were given important posts. Even some who refused to take the exam were given a title and rank. This led to a significant change in the attitude of Han intellectuals towards the Qing. With peace restored after the revolt of the three feudatories, Emperor Kangxi made important changes in his approach towards the selection and appointment of officials. Emperor Kangxi began to govern in his own right. He showed a strong appreciation of Chinese culture and employed intellectuals learned in the Confucian classics in important positions. This brought about a fundamental change in the political atmosphere. 5. Determination of economic policy in the socio-economic sector. The concentration of lands in the hands of landlords and the self-supporting and self-sufficient nature of feudalism further hindered the expansion of social productivity. The annexation of lands by landlords became a serious issue, as did the number of bankrupt farmers. During the reign of the Emperor Jiaqing (1796–1820), the area of arable land across the whole country reached 800 million mu (15 mu equals one hectare) with the vast majority of the land being owned either by landlords or bureaucrats at different levels. This closed-door policy and self-complacency were the basic features of Qing foreign policy, as determined by the fundamental conditions of its politics, economy, and culture. As early as the middle of the Qing dynasty, the central government had adopted a restrictive trade policy. Opening Canton as the one and only port for maritime foreign trade and Kyokta as the only place for foreign trade over land. Foreign merchants were allowed to do business only with government-authorized institutions. 
their business activities were confined, and the amount of goods for transaction was also highly restricted. This restrictive trade policy had a very negative impact upon Chinese society. In economic policy, Kangxi called a halt to land enclosure and focused on developing production. He issued many edicts to recruit people to work on land reclamation and paid particular attention to Yellow River flood control measures, always a priority for the Qing administration. A task which they carried out with considerable success, to the great benefit of the Yangtze and Wai River regions. In Kangxi's latter years, in response to the improvement in the country's finances and economic situation and the rapid growth in population, the emperor promoted a policy of no increases in taxation. Those people born after the census was taken are to be exempt from tax. Thus, the foundation was laid for the reform under which the farming land tax replaced the poll tax. Emperor Kangxi had laid down as a state policy no increases in taxation. While this policy was in force, some officials proposed substituting a land tax for the poll tax. And towards the end of Kangxi's reign, this idea started to be put into effect experimentally in Sichuan and Guangdong provinces. After Yongzheng's accession to the throne, it began to be generally applied. By the seventh year of Yongzheng's reign, it was being implemented everywhere except in Shaanxi, Fengtian, and Guizhou. This replacement of the poll tax by a land tax represents one of the most important tax reforms in Chinese history. It changed the nature of taxation for the Chinese people. By charging tax on land instead of by head of population, it benefited peasants who owned little or no land and resulted in a more rational distribution of the tax burden. At the same time, because land is a relatively stable asset, the source of taxation was placed on a firmer footing. In the area of economic policy, Qianlong prohibited the practice whereby officials provided inflated figures for the amount of wasteland brought under cultivation in order to boost their own reputation. He also waived the tax on grain that had been falsely reported. At the same time, he continued to encourage genuine land reclamation in order to feed the rapidly rising population. He sought to prevent fraudulent claims by ruling that isolated and scattered pieces of land that had been brought under cultivation should be exempt from tax. From Qianlong's second year, in order to reduce grain wastage, a ban on alcohol production came into effect in five provinces in North China. 6. Political reform and cultural policy Kangxi's successor Emperor Yongzheng made a determined effort to bring about political reform and introduced new measures to clean up the local bureaucracies. This to some extent overcame the long-standing abuses of Kangxi's later years. In order to resolve the conflicts over imperial succession, Yongzheng abolished the institution of the crown prince, which had been in existence since Han times. In its place he introduced a system of secretly naming the emperor's successor. On the occasion of an appeal for troops in the Northwest, he set up a grand military council, with the aim of adjusting the relationship between the Emperor and his ministers, further enhancing the Emperor's own authority. There had already been considerable cultural advances under Kangxi. 
His reign saw the completion of the celebrated Encyclopedia Grand Compendium of Ancient and Modern Books. Emperor Kangxi's profound learning and understanding of Confucian culture was a major factor in the creation of the early Qing Golden Age. Kangxi prided himself on his knowledge of the Confucian classics and his profound knowledge of the historical principles underlying good and bad government had a hugely beneficial effect on his rule. Yongzheng and Qianlong carried forward the work of Kangxi, the most representative achievement being the complete collection in four treasuries, Siku Quan Shu. A vast repository of Chinese scholarship, which took over 300 collaborators 10 years during Qianlong's reign to compile. It is the most important such collection in Chinese history. In the culture sector, the prevailing policy combined stick and carrot. Very strict measures were imposed on controlling people's thinking. While the civil service examination system from the Ming dynasty was retained so as to give intellectuals a chance to ascend to the upper class. On the other, they vigorously implemented literary inquisition and subjected the words and deeds of Han officials and intellectuals to close surveillance. Multiple literary persecutions took place during the reigns of the emperors Yongzheng and Qianlong. And threats against the rule of the Qing dynasty and popular revolts were cracked down upon one after another. Consequently, some intellectuals shut themselves away from government affairs and the real world burying themselves in reading old books and textual criticism. This cultural despotism resulted in an atmosphere of bleakness and desolation which enveloped the whole ideological and cultural field. 7. Resolution of frontier issues A further important constituent of the golden age of the reigns of emperors Kangxi, Yongzheng, and Qianlong was their handling of the frontier regions. The concept of homeland as inseparable from territory. The recovery of sovereignty over Taiwan during Kangxi's reign marked the beginning of the Qing's push to settle China's frontier questions. With the settlement of the revolt of the three feudatories, Emperor Kangxi appointed Shi Lang Admiral of the Fujian Navy and set about actively planning the recovery of Taiwan. In the 22nd year of Kangxi's reign, Qing troops launched a full-scale attack on Taiwan. Taiwan was thus recovered in a single operation. The Qing established a prefectural government on Taiwan, with troops stationed there. The situation in Mongolia was very complex. The Zunghers alternated periods of allegiance and rebellion and were at war with the Qing on and off during the reigns of Kangxi, Yongzheng, and Qianlong. In Kangxi's time, the Zunghar leader, Galden, attacked Khalkha and then invaded Inner Mongolia but was defeated by Qing troops after which other Mongol groups in Qinghai went over to the Qing. In order to oversee the administration of Outer Mongolia, Emperor Yongzheng created the post of Deputy General for pacifying the frontier in Uliastai to take charge of military affairs in Tanu Uriankai and to govern four Kalka tribes and other subordinate tribes. The area administered was equivalent to present-day Outer Mongolia, parts of Russia, Kazakhstan, and the northern part of the Altai region of Xinjiang and was collectively referred to as Outer Mongolia by the Qing government. In the last years of Kangxi's reign, 
The Qing abolished this regime in Tibet and appointed three temporary officials known as Kaolins to administer Tibetan affairs. In the fifth year of Yongzhan, following the quelling of an internal rebellion, military forces began to be stationed in Tibet and a post of resident commissioner, known as Ambin, was created. In Qianlong's 57th year, the Qing court reorganized the administration of Tibet and established the so-called Jinbenba system, whereby a golden urn was used for drawing lots as a means for identifying tulkus or reincarnated lamas. 8. Religious beliefs and philosophy at the time Wang Fuji 1619-1692, whose courtesy name was Ernong, was born in Hangyang, Hunan Province. His initial engagement in the anti-Qing dynasty movement failed, and then he found refuge at the foot of Mount Xuanshan to the west of the Shang River. This is why he has the pseudonym Xuanshan. Wang Fuji took a holistic approach to summarizing ancient Chinese thought. Wang Fuji's works can be divided into about 70 categories and run to over 400 volumes which were later collated as Chuan Shan's surviving books. Wang Fuji's understanding of Tai Chi is just the indefusible movement of yin and yang, which can be called yin yan. Therefore, the relationship between Tai Chi and Yin Yang is not like father and son, nor is it like creator and created. Tai Chi by nature encompasses countervailing elements like Yin and Yang. Thus, everything in the world has its countervailing elements. Tai Chi is no exception. He emphasized that containing countervailing elements is the nature of everything without exception. Everything in nature contains the following elements in opposing pairs, calmness and restlessness, hardness and softness, fortune and misfortune, favor and adversity. Wang Fuji has his own unique perspective on the issue of the motion and stasis of objects. He contended that when yin and yang coexist indefusibly, a state known as Tai He Yin Yun, they are still, by nature, in motion, though this may not be obvious on the surface. People have observed the stasis and the motion of specific objects, all of which are by their nature in motion, and are the embodiment of the Tai He Yin Yan. Thus, Wang Fuji focused on promoting the Confucianist doctrine of human nature. 9. The Society of the Late Qing Dynasty and the Westernization Movement Facing Such a Deep Economic and Social Crisis and out of their concern to maintain the rule of the Qing dynasty, some officials from the ruling groups strongly advocated adopting Western practices. Prince Gong believed that statecraft lies in self-improvement. Under the current situation, the key is to train the army. The prerequisite of which is to manufacture advanced weapons, Li Hongzheng, 1823 to 1901, also contended that the self-improvement of China depends on the study of foreign advanced weapons. To achieve this, China must learn to imitate big machine production from the West. This is how the westernization movement, aimed at establishing a modern military industry, came into being. The main priorities of the westernization movement included hiring foreign military officers, purchasing foreign guns and cannons, training new ground forces, creating the South China Sea Fleet and the North China Sea Fleet, reforming the Fujian fleet into a modern navy, 
and establishing a number of military industries. 24 military enterprises were initiated during this period, such as the Jongnan Shipyard in 1865, the Jinling Machine Bureau in 1865, the Fuzhou Dockyard in 1866, and the Tianjin Machine Bureau in 1867. However, the development of a military industry requires sufficient backing from a strong national economy. The commencement of modern military industry initiated a series of changes and raised many new questions. Their financial requests could not be fully met by traditional economic and taxation policies. At this time, Uprisings staged by farmers throughout China were put down one after the other, and foreign businessmen had already set up many factories. All these stimulating factors pressed the westernization movement to transfer from a military-centered stage onto a civilian-oriented one. Under this new circumstance, a large number of civilian enterprises were created by adopting various models ranging from investment by government alone. A government supervision and merchant management mode, to a government-private partnership mode. Examples of civilian enterprises set up at this stage include the China Merchant Steamship Navigation Company in 1872, the Kaiping Mining Bureau in 1878, the Tianjin Telegraph Office in 1880, the Shanghai Machine Weaving Bureau in 1882, and the Mohe Mining Bureau 1888. The Hubei Textile Company was founded by Zhang Zedong in the later period. Their products were sold mainly on the domestic market, and cost control was vital for ensuring a profit. The relationships between the enterprises and the employees were basically the relations between the labor and the capital. Funds raised for establishing companies mainly came from private capital. So the civilian industrial enterprises which emerged during the westernization movement were identified as being modern and capitalist in nature. The establishment of civilian enterprises symbolized the birth of capitalist modes of production in modern Chinese history. These enterprises trained a large number of technical workers who were familiar with modern production methods and techniques, laying a primary foundation for the formation of China's modern economic pattern. To a certain degree, they played a part in resisting capitalist economic invasion from abroad. But it must be pointed out that both military and civilian industries still bore the strong characteristics of feudalism and were heavily dependent on foreign capital. The military industry was monopolized by government agencies, and it sometimes served as a tool by which warlords could expand their sphere of influence. Clearly, the westernization movement was not only involved with training military forces and setting up enterprises, but it was also concerned with sending students to study overseas. Learning Western science and technology, and translating Western books and magazines. All of these factors show that a minority of Chinese people had already relinquished their arrogance and pride and were prepared to accept that China was inferior to the West in some aspects. China had already made its first step towards building a modern society during the 40 years between the 1860s and 1890s. The Qing government regarded the westernization movement as a means of self-preservation, for the old ruling model could not continue under the present turmoil. 
If reforms were not carried out on a material level, the social and economic crisis affecting the whole of society would bring their rule to an end. Viewed from the perspective of social development, the westernization movement was a comparatively low-level modernization campaign. Even though it had many drawbacks, as a testbed for modernization. The westernization movement deeply shook the economic structure of China's traditional agriculture society. The primary establishment of modern machine production marked the beginning of China's transition from being a traditional agricultural society towards becoming an industrialized modern society. On June 11, 1898, the Emperor Guangxu issued the decree on national plan confirmation and officially started the process of reform and self-improvement from the real record of Dezong Emperor of the Qing Dynasty. This was later regarded as the beginning of the Hundred Days Reform. During this period, the reformists helped the Emperor Guangxu to release over 110 edicts with the contents covering the following aspects, promoting industrial development, establishing national banks, agriculture, industry, and commerce bureaus, encouraging private investment and invention, building railways, exploiting mines, reforming finance and taxation, encouraging freedom of speech and allowing petition, <laughs> streamlining institutions, straightening official management, amending laws and rules, permitting the establishment of schools and publishing houses, allowing freedom of speech and freedom of the press, reforming the imperial examination system, abolishing the old-style writing of eight-part essays, initiating the economic discipline, setting up an imperial university in Peking and so on. The 1898 reform movement was a meaningful experiment in saving the nation from crisis and realizing how the country could be modernized through institutional reform. Its failure was caused by various factors, but it heralded how capitalist revolutionists, headed by Sun Yat-sen, would play a leading role in Chinese history. <laughs>